sweet hero trash you look wonderful tonight with your smudged eyeliner underneath the bathroom lights this night could go on forever or just end up in a fight you know that we're the ones that never Hey there! Welcome to the premiere episode of Sweet Euro Trash with Big Bang Wayne. Before we get started, I'd like to just take a moment to thank Big Rich Wheeler and BRRS Media. Uh, without you guys, none of this would be possible, and I appreciate you guys taking a chance on me. For the premiere episode, we're going to do something just a little bit different than what we're normally going to do here on Sweet Euro Trash. When uh, Rich asked me if I'd be interested in doing a podcast, I told him absolutely, but my only stipulation was I get to choose my first guest. So we're going to take a little look back about my childhood a little bit and growing up for music for me. And uh, tonight's guest is a really good one, somebody I'm really excited to have on the show. So uh, let's take a look here. Um, when I was uh, growing up in Oklahoma, in small town Oklahoma, we, we didn't have a lot to do. Uh, if on a Friday or Saturday night, if we could find somebody to buy us beer, that would be great. We'd ride up and down the same roads all night long, chasing girls and running from the cops. Music was always something that was always really important for me, too. I often even lived vicariously through the lyrics of some songs. I've rode the rodeo scene with Chris Ledoux, moved to Mexico with Eddie Raven, I've drank myself into oblivion with Gary Stewart, and turned 21 in prison with Merle Haggard. I was also fortunate to be in Stillwater, Oklahoma, a home of Oklahoma State University in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. And one of the kinds of music that came up from this area was called Red Dirt. And tonight's guest I have with me, I have Mike McClure. Mike's a musician, he's a songwriter, he's a producer, and he's a former frontman for the band The Great Divide. And The Great Divide was uh, always a great band for me. I really enjoyed being in Stillwater at the epicenter of Red Dirt when these guys came out. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the interview. everybody welcome to the show um as promised i'm here with mike mcclure mike how you doing and uh, let me say first of all thanks for being on the show thank you big bang can i call you big bang absolutely please do um, all of my friends do <laughs> oh, i'm uh yeah thanks for uh thanks for finding me you know it's pretty interesting uh wayne here is his uncle lives about a stone's throw from the house i grew up grew up in tecumseh oklahoma uh, about oh he's probably 200 yards from our house but uh yeah so fellow okie good to talk to you you're over in germany yeah and, thank you uh, very much and i appreciate i appreciate you mentioning that um I, as i was doing a little bit of research for the interview here i i actually came across that and talked about that with my cousin and he yeah. said my cousin says that his very first job was um in the creek that used to run out in front of your house that he used to catch bait for your brother to go fishing with <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we did a lot of seining around there. You know, you get a sane one, one guy on one end, one the other, and just drag it through a creek or river. That's and exactly, I that's, my brother about that. That's exactly what we used to do. And I, I've come to find out that I actually worked for my cousin at the time. And I think he, with interest and everything, he owes me about $17 million now. So this has absolutely oh, no. been beneficial. Uh, well, when you get back in the States, we'll swing by, see what we can't do. Absolutely. We'll get you your finder's fee on that, huh? Of course. All right. So, um, Mike, um, um, you know, um, like I talked about earlier in, in the preview here of the show, that um, uh, we both come from Oklahoma, growing up in small town Oklahoma. Uh, tell me, what, what did you do as a young man uh, finding your way through small town Oklahoma? Well, lucky, luckily, when I was young, I, I started playing guitar. My dad, my dad played guitar and, and still does. And, he played and sang around the house, Merle Haggard stuff, uh, Kingston Trio stuff, and and by the time I turned ten, I saw I saw the movie Honeysuckle Rose with Willie Nelson in it, and I I just fell in love with that character, you know, Buck Bonham was his name in that movie, 
but it was just Willie, you know, a, a guy traveling from town to town playing music. And that kind of that planted the seed of, of what I wanted to, wanted to do and just it never left me, you know. What was, uh, and so after getting a guitar at 10, I, I started playing then and just kept at it. So by the time I was in, you know, my teens, early teens, I could play a lot of rock and roll stuff. Uh, it's mainly influenced by uh, my brother's five years older than me and I'm 48 at the, at this time. And uh, so I, I got a dose of some classic, what's now classic rock, you know, Creedence Clearwater. Actually, a, a wrestling coach in Tecumseh, uh, he brought over some records. Uh, my dad was the athletic director. And uh, Coach Lloyd, yeah, he brought over a stack of Creedence Clearwater, Steppenwolf, uh, just all these records. And I, I never had and never heard. So I, I wore all of them out and really – a lot of what I do is is based off of you know either kind of Willie Nelson, outlaw country, or you know some form of rock and roll, which I grew up on. I've always really enjoyed the uh, the, the hard and attacking riffs that you have in your music. That was something that was, uh, we can talk about a little bit later on, but something about Red Dirt music that really appealed to me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, with with that, I think you know there was a lot of different bands. In Red Dirt, it wasn't actually one sound. It was more kind of a more of a philosophy as far as like I'm gonna I'm gonna do my thing. Like Jason Bolin and the Stragglers, uh, we came up, you know, with with them. Cross Canadian Ragweed, The Great Divide was my original band, and uh, and and just everybody had a different. Cody and Cody was more, you know, their their music was a little harder edge. Some of it, and Jason was more of a honky tonk. Uh, more honky tonk elements to it. And, and my stuff came from getting into Steve Earle, getting into Guy Clark songwriters. And, and then Steve Earle was bringing this ballsy rock and roll to it with Copperhead Road. And, you know, when I went to, while I was in Stillwater, I would go into the music store and they were always playing Steve Earle. And uh, I asked him, who is this? And then that's how I got into his stuff, which greatly influenced me. I love Copperhead Road. I think that's one of the most influential early rock and roll country songs. Um, what what year did that come out? That must have been somewhere maybe that's in the early nineties. Yeah, I went to Stillwater in the early nineties. Okay. And, uh, the cool thing about that record is is a guy named Tony Brown signed Steve Earle to uh, oh what was the label MCA, and he decided after Guitar Town. Steve wanted to make a more rock and roll record. And so he went, Tony took him to Arden Studios in Memphis and did an album with Joe Hardy. And that was Copperhead Road. They, through working with Ragweed over the years and producing them, I did an album of theirs called Garage. And uh, that record, Tony Brown introduced me to Joe Hardy, who had made Copperhead Road, which was, you know, one of my favorite records. And so we started working together in 05 and worked together up until his death last year. So it was, a, uh, it, it was, a, uh, it's, it's really cool how your influence will come back to you. And that was in some way that was, that was like a signpost for the path I should be taking, you know? Uh, that's great. Um, and then, so after, uh, after high school, you, you went off to Stillwater and what brought you exactly to Stillwater? Was this basically to attend OSU and then everything that happened around that, or was there something special that brought you to, uh, Stillwater, uh, for the music wise? Well, I went my first two years of college, I went to Seminole junior college in Seminole and I got a full ride playing music. They had a, a department to where it was a stage band and you auditioned and, you know, basically we were just a band that played current hits and, and would go as a recruitment tool to different high schools, you know, to try to recruit them to that school. And that paid for our school. So I, I went two years there and then uh, I wasn't really sure where I was going to go for my, to finish up my other two years. And one of my best friends from home, Steve Holland, he, uh, he had moved to Stillwater and I knew him and another guy that lived up the road from, us and Larry, this guy named Larry Stafford. They live the Staffords lived up on the corner, and uh, up on the corner. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's that's the reason I wound up going there to Stillwater, and just because I, I knew a couple of buddies I'd grown up with that that were living there, and at least I'd have somebody that I knew, and I. You know, Stillwater's a pretty big town compared to Tecumseh. Uh, it is indeed, and a pretty wild town as well. Yeah. 
Do what? Uh, it's pretty wild town as well, especially there yeah, in, yeah, in the late nineties. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. You know, it was everybody was coming out of the oh, uh, you know, like the Motley Crue debauchery era. Sure, then, the end of the big hair, the hair yeah, bands, yeah. And all the excess, which was just ridiculous. But but growing up, you know, we did some of that just because that's what we saw and that's what we emulated. And I'm thankful to be on the other side of all of that. <laughs> I, I'm, I can imagine so, yeah. <laughs> the 80s were rough on a lot of us. So. Yeah, then, uh, but in, in Stillwater about that time, you know, people my age, uh, this is around, well, I graduated high school in 89. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, Kurt Cobain came along and grunge just put an end to all the big hair and wild bullshit. And, uh, in, in a quick second, yeah, that happened yeah, really yeah. quickly really quickly but at the time now i like nirvana now and pearl jam love them but at the time it was just a little too too heavy for what i was listening to because i came from listening to top 40 rock and roll and you know metal was on in the top 40 <laughs> right and uh so garth brooks came along about that time and and that reminded me of the stuff i'd learned with my my dad from old merle haggard you know much too young to feel this damn old when I heard that song, I was like, wow, that's, that's a really cool country song. And I hadn't really even thought about country. And so that was pretty big time for me as far as influence goes. You know, I, I agree with that 100%. And, and speaking of that Garth Brooks record, that was a, a great record. I remember when that came out as well. A uh, local Oklahoma boy that made it good. It was fun to listen to the radio and hear him on the radio all the time. But he was also one of those pioneers in that progressive style music that became uh, that progressive country music that became really popular there throughout the uh, mid 90s into the early 2000s i i really enjoyed that country music i have to say yeah tom skinner played bass for garth back in those early days in stillwater you know that uh, no i didn't i i know um tom skinner is a good for was a good friend of yours and yeah. was always a, a big influence on you and and, and yeah, he was an older guy some, yeah, and you have some great stories about him. I actually heard you tell a little bit of the story about him wrestling a blind guy or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tom was just this, uh, he passed away a few years, uh, just not very many years back. And uh, uh, he was he, he played bass with, in my band and sang back up with me for 10 years. So we were we were really tight and been around the world together. and. But back in his Stillwater days, he had the Skinner Brothers Band, which was him and his brother Mike and Craig. And uh, Garth was a big fan of theirs. So when Garth wanted to put a band together, which is called Santa Fe, uh, Tom played bass in that band. And, and so uh, he moved out to Nashville with Garth in the, oh, I see, it had been the late 80s. And about six months before Garth signed the deal, Tom moved back home. He's like, ah, it's, <laughs> going nowhere. <laughs> what a heartache. <laughs> Some monumentally bad moves. Oh, man. No, but I, I'm i glad he did because I, I might not have met him and got to know him. And he was just a super talented songwriter. Uh, just one of the first guys I'd met that, that said, oh, I'm a songwriter for a living. Him and Bob Childers both in Stillwater. And, and yeah, uh, that's how they got their money and they lived accordingly. And, and I, I'd never been around somebody like that. You know, I, I met some people from, you know, out in Nashville or something, but, but just someone that wrote their, their songs, played them and lived with, and that was super inspirational. That meeting them was about the time we started Great Divide, which was 92. Right. I, I can imagine. Uh, I'm Bob Childers. Uh, a lot of our listeners might not be familiar with him, but um, uh, he's often referred to as the godfather of Red Dirt. And so I guess that at this time you were probably hanging out at what they call the farm here with Bob and Tom and all of those guys, right? Yeah, when I uh, first started hanging out in Stillwater, uh, I was living with our bass player at the time. We, we had an apartment together. And um, we came home one day and Bob Childers was sitting on the front porch. And I'd never met him before. And he got long gray hair and, you know, looked like hobo number one sitting out here. <laughs> I was like, hello? Can I help you? And he said, yeah, I heard y'all got a band. I'm a songwriter. And he gave me Circles Towards the Sun, which was, uh, you know, Bob and Tom were some, and Randy Crouch, Red Dirt Rangers. They were the, what you hear of Red Dirt, that's where that all started and those people. And, uh, and uh, yeah, 
Lost yeah. what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, uh, you were talking about the, um, the Red Dirt and the farm and hooking up with those guys. Um, uh, oh, yeah. There was a lot of creative guys that got together in there. Um, you, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, and you said that you might be willing to play a song for us or something. Maybe you got something on the top of your head that uh, came out of that Red Dirt time, maybe, that you, you might be able to play yeah. for us? Sure. Look out. Watch out. Yeah, no, give Just an interesting question here. I, I recently uh, purchased my first guitar, so to say. And uh, um, of course, the question that I came across was it proper to name your guitar? Mike, do you have a name for your guitar? I never named one, really. Nope. Okay. Some people do, some people don't. I was just a little bit curious about that. I've got a lot of them. I can't go remembering names, you know? <laughs> like old girlfriends and wives, huh? <laughs> no guitars. Yeah, Mike, what are you going to play for us? Uh, I'll do a song I wrote wrote while I was uh, hanging out at the farm. You know, this has been early 90s, and a guy came along named Bob Klein that owned this Route 66 Cafe in Stillwater, and, and uh, he put together a little budget to record. It's called the Red Dirt Sampler, which was, uh, I may have a copy. I'd have to hunt pretty hard to find it, but. It had, I had a song on there, or actually two songs. Tom Skinner had some, Bob Childers, Red Dirt Rangers, Monica Taylor, uh, just a bunch of folks. Scott Evans, I believe. It's called Wildfire. Would it fly with this creepy ruling pasture? I can see you waving in the wind up on the hill. You were always such a wild flower. Flowers fade away, but doubt you ever will. What if I came walk through your pasture, lay down next to you and close my weary eyes? Your fragrance, it comes floating down the summer breeze. That puts a smile back on my face every time. You were always such a wild flower. Ever since you were a child, don't go changing. Just to try to please someone, wildflowers best stay wild. I know someday somebody's going to pick you up off the ground and they will place you in their face for the whole wide world to see. I will always remember greener pastures. You were waving in the wind right next to me. You were always such a wild flower ever since you were a child. Don't go changing just to try to please someone. Please yourself, just stay wild. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, uh, we'll jump back into this here. We were uh, talking about uh, the, the uh, early days there in Stillwater. Um, uh, oh, yeah, the Wormy Dog. When I, also, when I first moved there, uh, uh, the guy that I lived with, a guy named Chuck Thompson, he, uh, he started the Wormy Dog Saloon. And so we lived together, and then his slowest night was Monday night. And so I started – Ask him. I said, "Hey, I'll come in and play on Monday since no one's here anyway." And so we, I started doing that and slowly building up Monday nights. And then, and then I met Cody Canada, and he started playing with me on Mondays. And then I got him Tuesday night. So I'd play Monday night. He'd play Tuesday, and then he uh, he helped get Jason Bowen and Stoney involved. They were more similar in age, and. Uh, and so, yeah, one time everybody was playing. There was just a little group of bars that you'd go play and you'd have your crowds and your crowd would go to their crowd and, and back and forth. It was a real special time. You know, there was a lot of, 
lot of brotherhood in bands and coming out of the eighties, the late eighties, there wasn't a whole lot of brotherhood with the bands. They were more like our band will destroy your band. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but just the attitude of people around there was really nice. You know, we were all from small towns in Oklahoma and Stillwater was a big city to us. So it was, it was a lot of, of moving to a bigger town and, and become, was that me? It was. Oh, it was. Hold on, let me mute this thing. It's the yeah, neighbors. Yeah. It's the neighbors telling you to come get your chickens. It's Larry down south, huh? Yeah. Where's Larry down south when you need it? No shit, huh? <laughs> but uh, Wrangler from yeah. way back, yeah. We were all just playing on the same strip, and it was a great time. And then about the time you know you'd ask if it was like walk around like kings, so well, we didn't really know it was going on at the time, you know, and it was just fun. And then about the time the Great Divide got signed, we got signed to Atlantic in 98. And that, that took us out of the, you know, the local scene all the time. And, and we started touring around the country. Yeah, that would have been about the time. Um, I, I think I left Stillwater in about 2000 or so. And I wasn't ever fortunate enough to actually catch you or the Great Divide. Um, but I, I spent many a nights wandering up and down the strip there in Stillwater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, it's changed quite a bit you know the wormy dog in there anymore there's not even one in oklahoma city anymore it uh, should so yeah, it was just a different time a long time ago about 92 to oh probably 96 or 97 i probably played around there okay yeah, yeah. i would have i would have been there just a little bit after that so we, we were two ships passing in the moment there yeah <laughs> you you were getting out of town and i was getting into town yeah yeah, not a hell both of us. Yeah, I stayed there for a few years. It was really nice. Yeah, I did like too. I, I, I moved to Ada probably about 16, 15 years ago, maybe. Okay. Uh, I've been here ever since. Um, so um, you, you said that Atlantic signed you guys in, what was that, 96? 98. Ni 98. Uh, um, yeah. what, what was that like dealing with the music industry? I know a lot of people have dreams and hopes of getting into the industry. And, and what's the yeah, reality of it? It's a ring, you know, everybody wants to reach for. Because growing up, I read every book about every band I could get my hands on. And uh, so I, I definitely wanted, wanted that in my life. And so uh, we we'd put out our second independent CD called Breaking the Storm. And we sold about 20,000 copies uh, on our own. This was, we were the record label. We, we hired radio promoters and we just attacked it like we were the record label. And, and that, that started to be successful. And Atlantic saw what we were doing and pretty much just signed us and repackaged Breaking the Storm, shot a couple videos, put those out. And uh, yeah, so they just basically repackaged and put out the same album that we had recorded. And then the next album we did, we did on our own as well, which was fairly rare in Nashville at the time. And we got in on the, the tail end of Nashville, really. It was, uh, you know, it had its boom in the early 90s and, and on through. But towards the end of the 90s, it was kind of kind of suffering the, the major labels were, for sure. Okay. Just that, that whole paradigm shifted. But, you know, we got to we got to do that and got to tour around and meet a lot of folks, play a lot of cool gigs. It, it you know, it was it was okay being on a label. They didn't dictate anything to us. I think that's where most people get uh up in arms about a label about is when they start infringing on your artistic freedom. Exactly. I, have, I hear a lot of people that will have some complaints about that uh, or the, the the production time or the lack of production time is also a problem sometimes. Yeah, and you got non-music people trying to tell music people how to do music, and but with Atlantic, they left us alone. They they didn't want to mess with it and change anything because it was working, and so they let us. We played our own instruments, and you know a lot of bands would would like the singers would sing, but the instruments were done by you know top flight, top-notch studio musicians. Right. And, uh, you know, we were decent players. We weren't top notch by any means, which kind of gave our records <laughs> a different sound. Yeah, I'm really glad Atlantic left uh, Breaking the Storm the way it is. I don't know exactly how I got my hands on a copy of it. 
day it was there. I had it on cassette and man, Mike, I, I, I put, I put, I wore that thing out driving up and down highway 177 and between Stillwater and Oklahoma, trying to get over heartaches from girls there in Stillwater that broke my heart a couple of times. Yeah. So that was a great album. So I, I don't know if I had the Atlantic version of it or the uh, self-produced version of it, but I, I'm glad they didn't change it much because I, I think that's a great album. It's definitely one of the albums that influenced my early or late teenage and early 20 years. That's a, just a great album. Well, thanks, man. A lot of the credit of those records goes to Lloyd Maines. He was our producer. And uh, when it started, we had an album out before Breaking the Storm. Our first one was called Going for Broke. And we went to Lubbock, Texas, and uh, we cut it with Lloyd Maines, who's Natalie Maines' dad, a renowned steel guitar player and producer, Robert O'Keefe, uh, Jerry Jeff Walker, Dixie Chicks, all kinds of stuff. But, but Lloyd was really great because we were super green and we never did a whole lot of recording. And uh, so Lloyd was very instrumental in, in taking what we had and making the best of it. And we did uh, three albums with Lloyd all the way through Revolutions. Do you enjoy being in the studio, Mike? Yeah, I do, especially when, you know, when I've, I've recorded for a long time now, but back then it was all new and, and uh, I hadn't even tried my role as a producer yet. I was just uh, just an artist. And, and Lloyd is a great producer and someone that I learned a lot of how to make records with. But uh, between him and Joe Hardy, uh, Joe taught me how to, to actually run the computer and do the engineering side. I used to just do the production end where I would come in and just sit with the band and someone else did all the you know, moving the mics around, recording the signals and whatnot. But Joe, over the years, taught me how to do that. So, yeah, it's uh, it's some. Uh, he, he got tired of me me waiting until I had some money to go rent a studio uh, so we could work on a record. So he sent me a bunch of stuff in the mail and, and walked me step by step through hours of of how to how to make records. And he's made some great ones. You know, he, he's done uh, ZZ Top stuff from Afterburner on. Uh, just really some Chris Knight records that I liked. He's, he's just a great guy. Unfortunately, he's passed on, too. It seems to be, uh, as I'm getting older, a lot of my old favorite um, heroes and legends are dying. It's a, it's a real shame. Huh? It's a, one of the yeah. heartache, heartaches of getting older. Yeah, yeah there's not a lot. A lot of longevity in that old road life, you know. <laughs> no, um, that's actually that's a great segue. That was just going to bring me there to my to my next topic. I was going to ask you about that here with the uh, in the we'll say the heyday of the Great Divide. You guys were touring quite a bit. Um, what were some of the experiences that you had on the road that'll stick with you maybe for the rest of your life? That were good, things that were bad. Uh, my favorite memory of all of it was uh, it was. I guess in the year 2000, we got to open for Willie Nelson in oh. Deadwood, South Dakota, up at the Sturgis, the big hog rallying. Sure, sure. Everybody should be familiar with Sturgis, huh? Yeah. Yeah, anyway, we, we went on at two, and I think Willie went on at four. But when we got there early in the day, I just got off the bus. We were traveling a lot by bus back then. I got off the bus, and there was this hill. It's kind of a, you know, hilly area, mountainous area. And I thought, I'm going to climb up that hill and take a look around. And uh, as I was on my way, way up, Willie was on his way down. He just, he just decided to climb that same hill. We passed each other on that hill. And I just said, oh, hello. And I didn't stop him or bother him for anything. It was just really kind of freaked out, like seeing a Bigfoot out in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> a free roaming Willie, huh? <laughs> yeah, but <next> Willie Nelson. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, after the show uh, – he listened to the show and, and we were standing up about to walk on stage and and uh mickey Raphael, his harmonica player was standing there and our drummer jj said why don't you come jam with us he goes all right and so he comes out on the stage and and jams with us for that set and which to me you know the whole willie seeing that honeysuckle rose is he was in that movie he was really young you know and you mentioned that earlier yeah he was a super cool guy mickey and uh so after after our show and Willie's show, we uh, their oh, their road manager came and said, "Hey, you guys want to meet Willie? Y'all can come on and and say hi and stuff." So, so we all piled on the bus, and I started telling him about started telling him about uh, this song I'd written, which was kind of a 
sequel to Redheaded Stranger. And uh, and I'm just kind of babbling on Starstruck. And, and he goes, well, play it for me. Uh, so I said, okay. And he hollered at his sister, and she brought Trigger out. Ah, oh, come on. Yeah. And he handed it to me, and and I was just in awe. And then I oh, man. I started tuning it, and those pegs are going, creak, creak, creak. <laughs> and I, I was afraid I was going to break it. So oh, I, man. I, I, man, would you tune this? I'm sorry. And handed it back, and he just laughed and tuned it. And I was sitting and handed it back to me, and I'm sitting there holding it, and, uh, you know, he passes over a joint. It was just, I was in that movie, you know, all of a sudden. And I played him a couple songs, and we hung out for a little while, and he had to hit the road. And he was just a really kind man, you know, it's, which is cool, because I idolized him ever since I was 10 years old. So to meet somebody like that, and they're super, super cool, you know, and... Of course, you want, you'd be hard-pressed to find a bad Willie Nelson story, you know. I can, a, I can imagine, yeah. Man, you know, just a kind-hearted guy. But he, he knew how much that meant to me, and he could, I know he could see that in my young, star-struck eyes, you know. It was a cool thing. Not but, yeah, I won't really ever cool. forget that, being able to, to touch the thing that made me want to get my own thing. <laughs> uh, now, that, that's amazing, Mike. I, I've seen uh, um, videos and um, read stories about Trigger. I watched an interesting YouTube video where the guy was uh, doing a refurb on it and fixing it up. And uh, it's just, a, it's amazing, man. The thing already played through. Did, did it already have the hold in it when, when you oh, played yeah. it? Yeah? yeah that, that was in there in the 70s. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. That's like a 60, I can't remember the year of it. I'd be lying if I said late 60s, I think. Yeah, that's that's yeah. All those, all those things all the way through. Yeah, huh? yeah. Just touch that thing was like the Ark of the Covenant. Now I can imagine. Now I can imagine. That's a great story. That's a great story. Um, that was that's probably my my favorite memory of being out because we we and we had a really good show and people up in South Dakota had come out to see us and uh, things were really starting to take off for us. Yeah, so um, is it true what they say? Hey, Willie's the Snoop Dogg of the country music industry. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I think he's finally sold down. A couple of guys in the band, they never had any. And so they were like on the moon for sure. <laughs> I, I, I just couldn't imagine that. That's got to be one, that's it's, one of the greatest stories I've ever heard, Mike. Smoke, smoking weed with Willie Nelson. Yeah. It's, it's just surreal when you meet somebody that you've, you've thought a lot about, you know? You know, I, I, I won't say his name, but I, I had a similar experience, but it kind of it went bad. Um, a, yeah. a, a songwriter, musician that I'd looked up to for a lot of years, also, um, you know, lyrics wise, somebody that I admired and was inspired by. And I was fortunate enough or say unfortunate enough in this event to have met him at a concert. And oh man, he was really just, we'll say the opposite of Willie. <laughs> it, it, yeah. was, uh, it, it made me feel like I, I was useless and in his way. And, kind of a little bit disappointing and yeah uh, that's not how you treat anybody you know i it happens you know i i'm sure you know everybody yeah. has bad days and i'm sure it probably I've wasn't anything you. personal you know it just uh just I've unfortunate different levels of being drunk and saying something wrong you know it just it's it's hard to imagine when what what you're catching somebody in that's, you know, a, that's exactly hopefully right. a bad day but still it's disappointing Maybe he'll get a chance to redeem himself one day. Yeah. Maybe so. Get, later, give me his name. I'll find him. Now, maybe his record label to tell tell him he has to do an interview with the Sweet Euro Trash and Big Bang Way. Now, <laughs> now, so um, um, so this was a uh, 2000. The story with Willie. So um, I guess uh, for a couple more years you toured with uh, the Great Divide, and then in 2002 you started uh, kind of. Like you said, uh, you, you touched Willie, you touched Trigger, and you started doing your own thing. Yeah, what, what, what did you start doing in 2002? That's when I put out my first uh, solo record while I was still in the Great Divide, which is an awkward situation that I wouldn't advise anyone to do. <laughs> I can only imagine. I, I, had, I had a bunch of different songs that you know, we would, we would make a record in the Great Divide and uh. We'd go out and tour it, and then we wouldn't be back in the studio maybe for a year and a half. Well, I was writing a lot of songs. That was a pretty prolific time for me, and and so I had just took some time. I, st I started producing a bit around that time. Uh, Cross Canadian Ragweed called me and said, hey, we want to hire you as a producer. I said, okay, I can do that. 
And so we did 377. And about that same time in that same studio, which was real time audio in Denton, Texas, about that same time, I, I started just recording with some friends, different, different stuff outside of the Great Divide. And uh, so I, I put that out. It's called 12 Pieces. What um, uh, it was, um, was there something, a uh, specific reason that you, or other than uh, um, just uh, the lack of studio time with the band to, to start going in your own solo career? Was, it, was this something that you had already planned? Uh, it, it's hard to say because I did leave the band in 2002, not because of that record, but certainly that record was an inclination. I wanted to do some stuff outside of the band. I, I wasn't real happy with the way the last studio record went down, uh, remain. It's a really great record, but it's just some, I don't know, management involved with, you know, we need, we need 10 singles, et cetera, instead of trying to make an album. Yeah. And, you know, so, so for that reason, I was leaning, you know, another way. And plus we'd been on the road for a while with each other and living in the same tight quarters. I think any band, you know, and plus everybody being younger and, and that's really our first band that did anything, all of us. And right. I was in some bands in high school and uh, the stage band, but that was the first band. So uh, it just, it just got to where it wasn't a healthy environment. Everybody was, communication was terrible. Direction was, was weird. And so I left in 2002, I believe. And then, Ten years later, we got back together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, man, I would have loved to have seen that. Um, that was the reunion show at Eskimo Joe's, yeah. right? No, it was out in uh, Tumbleweeds. Even better. Um, I love their Thursday yeah, and no, Saturday no. night penny beer night. Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah, we had uh, I think like seventy five hundred at that show, and uh, we're pretty sloppy. We've been playing, you know, ever since we play, or up up until recently. You know, we've been. We start. We were about to go out on a pretty big summer tour because we'd been playing, oh, maybe one show a month past few years, you know, yeah. up in Lincoln, Nebraska, or or in uh, San Antonio or wherever we played. And uh, yeah, that's been fun. Everybody, I, I, that was kind of my time out in the wilderness, I guess. You know, I, I had to go off and really figure out who I was as an individual and a person. You know, before I could even be a part of a group, you know. Right. Uh, so that's I, what most of that was. Uh, and and my records, are they're pretty much just me trying to figure myself out, you know, through different characters, different this and that. But but mainly it's usually a self-therapy session uh, record. Right. And, and, and somehow um, along the way, uh, the, the path led you to um, producing records yourself with Boo Hatch Studios, yeah? Can yeah, maybe talk uh, a little bit with us about that. Yeah, I uh, when I first started, let's see, my first studio to where I, I started producing quite a bit. I did, you know, several records, and then I started a studio where I bought the gear, and uh, Travis Linville had the space, and we combined. You know, he had some stuff, I had some stuff, microphones and everything. We put a studio in Norman. It was out by Lake Thunderbird called Dirty Bird Studios. <laughs> and, uh, I can't really, I'm trying to remember the timeline. It probably been around 06, 07. We did a Whiskey Myers record there, some Austin also, a bunch of different records. And uh, we both produced. And, and I still wasn't quite an engineer. It's when I started learning to engineer through Joe Hardy uh, that I started coming, that I built the studio here at my house. And, and where I'm sitting right now, this is the living room and underneath me, is uh, the basement, and that's where the first record I did there was Turnpike Troubadours, Diamonds and Gasoline, and uh, that one I did Katie Butt, Same Hell, Different Devil, Damn Quails, Down the Hatch. Uh, yeah, I've been doing that for a while, and you know I still record. Well, not right now, I'm not being around anybody, but you know, <laughs> up until all the pandemic started. Uh, right. Yeah. Did, you know, that's, that's part of how I keep the bills, bills paid is, is having a studio like that. But I've been fortunate enough now to where I can be a little more selective, you know, as far as what I want to put my time into. Now, um, what's, um, so for, as far as, um, uh, um, new stuff coming out of Boo Hatch, um, do you actively, uh, 
uh, search for some acts and talents yourself or are, are people reaching out to you mostly? Uh, people reach out to me and they know I record and I'm, I've, you know, I record quite a bunch of different bands on all different levels as far as, uh, you know, somebody's just getting started and they want to record. That's fine too. You know, as long as, long as people's hearts are in the right place, you know, I don't really mind the talent level and, uh, you know, it's fun to work with people and be able to help them, you know? Yeah, I see. I saw on your website uh, at um, boohatchstudios.com, maybe. Um, might get a, give a plug here, but I think um, I saw something where you were doing things for as far as like workshops, um, held, helping with um, songwriting, uh, um, uh, uh, song engineering, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, my girlfriend, Kristen Lawrence, she's, we've been together for a couple of years now and, and she's, she did a lot of uh, songwriter workshops and she's an artist as well. And, and uh, down in Austin is where we ran into each other again. And uh, she said, why don't you do a songwriter workshop? And she'd help, you know, we sat down and I, I had some, some talking points, but, but a lot of it is songwriters come in and it's a little kind of a community with five or six people. And, and you, you play your songs in front of people and you workshop them and, and you pass them around and, you know, that's, it's been really interesting because I, I, I was never around anything like that until I went to Stillwater and found the farm. And the, the closest thing was going out there and doing something similar to what we're doing here now is having a, a space for creativity and, and limited distractions. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we, we do one ever, I don't know, two or three months and we'll kick back up kick back up at it again once it's safe to do so, you know, okay. but, uh, that's been really interesting, really, uh, soul fulfilling work, you know, as far as I say work, it's not really work, but, you know, sitting around and, and talking songs. I, I didn't really, I didn't know what I'd have to offer as far as just talking, you know, with people about it. But once I got started, I'm passionate about it. So it's, it's pretty easy to keep talking and, and point out things that I've enjoyed and, you know, different writing tricks and tips and alliteration and all the good stuff I learned in school. <laughs> now that's really neat as a, as a, be a beginner musician, uh, as myself, I, I think that's something that I would, I would enjoy very much. Uh, next trip to Oklahoma around one of your workshops. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we've had people come from the East coast, West coast, South Dakota, you know, and a lot of places where they don't have any opportunity to, to sit down and, you know, have a little bit of structure to it, which was something that my girlfriend brought to the table because I was pretty unstructured until about the last two years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I like it. it. My life's better for it. And uh, just just putting putting some uh, new kind of effort into to working as opposed to just roaring and, you know, blowing and going. Yeah, so the rat race can get a little bit rough sometimes, huh? Uh-huh. So um, you mentioned here a while ago um, uh, doing a lot of your, your workshop stuff and uh, your concerts and touring uh, before the, the pandemic here. here. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not really keep a whole lot of time on this, this stupid virus, that's been, but um, wh what have you been doing to get through it? Are you, are you in quarantine or what, what's... Yeah, I've been staying home. <laughs> yeah? Uh, yeah, well, it, right now it's against the law to go play a show, but I, I wouldn't want to go out right now and play a show because I'm... of as people come together, you know, this virus isn't, it's a, an untamed beast at the moment. And, and I don't want to be involved in spreading, you know, if I happen to have contracted it, I don't know, I haven't been tested. If I happen to be to contracted it when I was up North and come back home and I see my parents, they're in their seventies. Yeah. And that that's really scary, you know, and the, until, I'm, I'm going to be staying right here and doing internet shows, uh, Facebook live shows instead of touring and, and, uh, just kind of waiting until it's safe right now. I just don't think it's safe, you know, in my own opinion. And, and I know people have to go back to work and that's their choice. And I just hope that they mask up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope so too, that everybody stays safe. Um, you said you're doing some Facebook shows, um, I, I caught one uh, live show uh, last Monday night um, for, for Germany time. It's a little bit rough. I had to stay up till three o'clock in the morning. Maybe you do a Sunday matinee show for us on one of these days or something. Yeah, I got but in Europe, I need to think about doing the, the European tour. <laughs> um, can you, can you maybe, 
<laughs> right. Um, I'll, I'll open up for you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> what um, um, could you maybe um, guide our listeners to where they might be able to tune in and catch one of your live shows? Yeah, if you go on Facebook, which most people are, it's Mike McClure Music. And my last name is M-C-C-L-U-R-E. Yeah, Mike McClure Music on Facebook. Every 8, 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, America. <laughs> uh, yeah, every 8 o'clock, uh, every Monday, sorry. We'll be sure to get some links um, in the text here in the description and make sure people can tune in there. And um, I also saw that um, as far as uh, 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 financial survival right now i saw also um, that maybe you've got you've got a paypal account linked also to the concerts as uh, people might yeah, like to it, it make some like small virtual, donations yeah it works like a virtual tip jar you know if you walked into a bar or, or you know we're all just hobos panhandlers right. <laughs> but uh yeah the virtual tip jar you know people throw in five some people throwing in a hundred bucks you know, oh wow just, just uh the the kindness of people i, I would like to say is it's been it's been great. It's it's allowed me to stay home, be safe, and it's allowed me to, you know, keep my lights turned on and food in the pantry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're we're doing okay, and and people have been. A lot of people have said, "Hey, man, I I don't mind throwing in, you know, some money, watch a concert right on my, you know, computer screen, and I'm sitting in my living room." I've enjoyed it a hell out of it, Mike. It's been a I've little bit like shows. <laughs> it's been a bit like a uh, storytellers. Yeah, I've enjoyed listening to the stories in between the songs, and uh, I can see that the people who tune into the shows are people that you're familiar with, and people that you've known for quite some time. So it's a it's a very it's a nice environment at the concerts. I have to say, I enjoy them very much. Yeah, and it's it's really the only socialization, you know that you can do and uh it, it it feels i feel a connection i thought at first it was going to be uh i'm going to be playing to this camera but just like now you know i'm talking to you i can feel the connection and you're on the other side of the world so that's it's it's great on that that end of things and and thankfully i've i've got people that are, are willing to throw you know dough in a tip jar to to be able to continue doing that. i don't know what i'd do you know honestly yeah, I understand. I uh, it's, it's horrible dish digger. <laughs> no, um, I, I it was totally completely worth it. I made a small little put a little tip in there. I got a song played. For me, it was a fair trade, and I, I would highly recommend to anybody that just wants to hear some good music. Um, uh, lots of uh, mostly original stuff, but you had a, a couple of uh, covers that you did. Uh, Carmelita by Warren Zevon was amazing, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I love that tune. I I first. First version, I, I guess I heard Dwight, when you mentioned you heard Dwight Yoakam's version, that dawned on me, oh yeah, that's where I probably heard it first. But then I heard Adam Duritz from the Counting Crows doing it on, uh, it's called the I-10 Chronicles, just some album I happened to pick up. Uh, Willie Nelson was singing, uh, what is that? Uh, oh, the water like stone. People talk, everybody's talking at me. I don't hear a word they're saying. Only the echoes in my mind. Yeah. What song is that? I'm sorry, I blanked on the guy's name. Harry Nielsen. Okay. Anyway, and Joe Ely had a song on there, but Adam Duritz did uh, Carmelita. And they had a, uh, one band, I think, played for the whole record. Okay. I-10 Chronicles, this is a real cool album. But that's where I heard Durich doing that, and I love the Counting Crows. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of theirs as well. Yeah, and uh, he he nails that song. I'll write that down. I have to check that. I and I'll go on record myself. saying that. Okay. Love you, Adam Durich. That's right, man. Um, <clears throat> so Mike, um, here uh, quarantine. We don't know sure how much longer it's going to last. Uh, when it's over, what are you going to do? What's the first the first place you're going to go? The first thing you're going to do? Uh, I don't know. You know, honestly, I've taken this, uh, the, the first month, you know, in April when we realized that, okay, these shows are not going to happen. And it's, that was scary. That was a, you know, a gut check when all that started happening. And then it was okay. Let's figure out how we're going to broadcast live out of here. And so, I, and luckily a friend of mine named Clay Mixon has long time ago sent me some gear as, as far as, you know, a microphone and for for this kind of stuff and cameras and 
and I've been messing with uh, stage shows and a little bit of little bit of this before, so it wasn't a total brand new shock. And uh, but we've we've just been you know running a garden, having a garden outside, running a garden, having a garden outside, and <laughs> chickens as you heard earlier. It sounds oh. like sounds like the garden's running you, Mike. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. The uh -huh. chickens really are. But it, it was a time where we could stop, and this is the first time since the the summer before I got my driver's license in the early '80s that I stayed on one piece of ground this long. Because I've been moving since I was 20, you know, 28 years of traveling and playing, and this has been at, at first it took me a while to just relax, you know, and. And then I realized how much life had been distracting me from enjoying it. You know, so many distractions of going here, going there, talking to this person, this and that. And, and since I've been home, I've been able to say, okay, I'm going to get up before I do anything. I'm going to stretch, have some coffee. I'm going to go outside and run, run around a little bit, get my heart going, sit down and have, and things have been scheduled and, and I've been getting a lot of work done. I started a blog again at my, my, uh, my, uh, website oh. band.com okay yeah for some what, reason band is still on there although it's just me <laughs> what, to, um, what sort of uh, topics um, are you uh, talking about on your blog just off the top of my head I, I challenged myself since I was home to sit down every day and uh, I've got one of those apps that simulates a, a typewriter with the clang 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 uh -huh. and uh, I learned to type on a electric typewriter back in high school and I love typing and I love writing and I just hadn't been doing it. I always write songs, but typing out a blog is a little different gear. And so I just made myself sit down, no topic and just start, uh, do one page and post that every day. And I got to post it even if it's horrible. So it's making me kind of work a little bit, you know, and stuff like that. And it got me thinking how I'd, I'd like to, you know, spend more time here at my house. <laughs> And, uh, and that just, that'll entail doing more workshops and uh, we do live concerts from right here where I'm sitting, you know, we'll put up chairs along and do like 35 tickets, you know, and when that's safe again, that'll be fun. But as far as traveling all the time, I, I just don't really, at this moment in time, I want to take, not do that as much. And so I'm learning how to try to be self-sufficient while I'm, while I'm home and then, that way going out and traveling will be an option and not just mandatory. That's right. That's uh, that would be a different mindset for me. And it's something I'm, you know, kicking around. Uh, I've really enjoyed, I thought I'd go crazy to tell you the truth sitting at home, but I think I, I was going crazy out running around like a madman. You know, this has yeah. been, this has been centering and grounding and I've been doing yoga. Yoga. Ridiculous over here. Oh my God. <laughs> Throw rocks at me if I was 20. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say here, uh, this is funny how this, <laughs> this circle kind of comes around here. If small town Oklahoma, all you want is out. Yeah. You yeah. get out and all you really want in the end is to go back home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I grew up, you know, by your uncle down there and uh, we had 10 acres and there's creeks and, uh, you know, just uh, barns, you know, animals and whatnot. And I've, pretty much been recreating that outside here. I have four acres. This place was, uh, it's in the middle of town, but it was built, been in the same family since the forties. So there's big tree line around me and it, it feels like you're secluded, although you're in the middle of town and it's just perfect. I've been just really honestly enjoying it. I'm, I'm worried about people out there, uh, especially older, vulnerable people. And you know, if my part, if I could, and, I can stay here another month or two before I have to go do something. I'm just want to try to stay here as long as I can and make this place even more home than it has been before. That's kind of the goal. Well, absolutely. Good luck with, with that. And um, maybe uh, if you got time, you uh, want to play one more song for us. And then, yeah, I'll uh, one from the motherland. And then we can, yeah, there you go. And then we can uh, maybe uh, do a last uh, a pitch here for, uh, uh, or last plug for some shows maybe that you might have coming up after the virus. And, uh, and then we can let you get out of here and go take care of your farm for the day yeah. before, before it gets yeah. dark, dark on you over there. I'll tell them what I've lost out there. <laughs> uh, I want to do a song for you. Actually, I'd like to do a new song. 
This is a new one I'm working on for the record. It's called Orion. But yeah, we're getting pretty close. Probably about three quarters done on a new album. And that's going to be coming out in the fall. Definitely be looking forward to it. late in the evening really almost morning in the middle of no way looking up for Orion that even track here comes shining like diamonds down through the air spinning so they say but I don't feel like I'm moving get a little closer every day yeah but closer's got me feeling closer's got me feeling farther closer's got me feeling farther closer only feels farther away hey hey Whoa, oh, hey. Hey, the moon has a dark side. It's long for the long ride. Just to push the tide away, pull it right back in. Well, the days all seem hectic, but this night feels electric. And Ryan is hiding, so I'm biding what's left of my time. And we're all spinning, so they say. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm moving. Get a little closer every day. Hey, but closer's got me feeling. Closer's got me feeling. Father, closer's got me feeling farther, closer only feels farther away, hey, hey, whoa, oh, hey. Very nice, Mike. I have to say I've uh, recently uh, purchased 25 years of Great Divide. And uh, I've been listening to it pretty much nonstop for about the past month. And yeah. I have to say, as soon as the song started just now, there was that uh, ring of familiarity of the Great Divide sound. And I, I liked it. Very good. I liked it from the top. Very nice. I'm sorry. You're right, so you're wrong. When you whisper, I love you. Yeah, I forget what you've done. You say, come back, baby. Hey, you know that I'll run. I should miss you. After what you put me through. I should be bitter. I should never want to talk to you. I should be changing directions Set my sights on someone new I shouldn't miss you But I do That's got me thinking About the way it used to be something has changed us is it you or is it me yeah the answers elude me they remain a mystery sometimes i see myself and i'm heading down this open road just 
one touch I'm beyond all help and I know God I know that I should miss you after what you put me through I should be better I should never want to talk to you Changing directions, set my sights on someone new. I should miss you, but I do. But I do. That's for Big Bang Way. Mike, that's amazing. I have to say for the last three minutes, I was uh, broken hearted again and driving my truck up and down Highway 177. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we we talked, we talked about someone's pain, man. You know, you know we talked about this uh, a little bit the other day when we had our little conference. Um, uh, you know, I told you that uh, I really appreciated uh, the Great Divide, the music, and it had helped me through so many hard times in my life. And you really kind of opened my eyes up when you told me, oh, Wayne, I understand that 100 percent, you know, uh, you know, as a, a songwriter, that doesn't make me immune to the effects of music. And uh, yeah, that was something that was like, you know, kind of an eye opener for me because, you know, you think, you know, uh, whatever, a doctor sees blood that doesn't bother him, you know, so maybe a, a songwriter doesn't get affected by, so, you know, the, the right four chords or whatever. You know, hearing Willie Nelson play on the road again, I wanted to, I wanted to do just that. Nah, I'm speaking, uh, speaking of on the road again, Mike, um, uh, I, I don't know how long I've, I've had you here yet, but I don't want to keep you here all night long. But um, uh, I guess at some point in time, this uh, virus, and we're going to get back to normal life. Um, what kind of shows do you have lined up coming up? Well, hard to even put anything down because, you know, uh, I've, I've canceled everything through May for sure, which was mostly private parties. Uh, and you know some some clubs here and there, but it's just it's it's hard to even speculate. You know I don't know because if you go if if a place does social distancing six feet at a concert, you're only going to be able to get so many people in. It's not able to pay for the the place, the sound, the band, all that kind of stuff. So right. we, we may be the last thing to open back up. You know, and, and, unless there's some rapid medical change, and that's what I hope for. You know, so it's, it's something I'm not even really looking at right now it's because I can write some, you know, dates down on the calendar, but it's, it's just not, it's just not time yet. Okay. So, you know? so for, for the foreseeable future, we're out at the house and doing Facebook shows. Yeah. I'm going to be right here, man. <laughs> you can't really complain about that. Huh? No, I, I can't. And honestly, even if everything opens back up, I'm going to continue to do a Monday night show. It's, it's uh, it's just fun. It's a different thing, and people can tune in. And if really, if they don't have any dough, that's fine. They can still watch it on Facebook. I'm not gonna, you know, track everybody. Oh, you didn't tip. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, no, I have to say, you know, um, it's just like, like open your guitar case on a street corner, and, and sure. some some people are gonna chunk in there. Some some are just gonna stand there and film you. you sure, know? sure. Yeah, I I'm, I I have nothing against tipping street musicians. I I am I was in Hamburg for ten years and. There's nothing to walk through the streets there and pass 20 or 30 guys out hucking on the street. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, uh, it's just kind of virtual that. And, and the neat thing is I'm, I'm able to hook up with people all over the world, you know, J just like this, you know, had I been out traveling around to Fort Worth for the nine millionth time, <laughs> I might not have been home to be able to do this. Yeah, not only that, I have to say I've appreciated watching the shows. Living here in Germany, there's not very many opportunities to see yeah. you, so uh, I, I've really, really enjoyed it, and it's, it's kind of been like a nice little trip down memory lane, uh, and I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and doing the interview with us. Well, you bet, man. I think this time has been... Uh, I've reconnected with some old high school friends just because I'm home, and, and uh, you know, you slowed down long enough to think about something other than just the next thing that's right in your face and right. uh, it, it's been a good thing i hope people that you know in this time don't panic and freak out but use it if they can you know as time to you know 
reassess some things uh, the way we've been living, you know, and I've, I'm doing that too, which is, I've learned to make bread because I stood in a grocery store and there wasn't any bread. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know, I don't want to get caught like that again. So I learned how to make bread. So right. yeah. that some chicken still left outside, you know. <laughs> They're getting thinner. Yeah, there's still only two at least now. Yeah. Yeah, maybe thinning out by cats. But. <laughs> by the time but, we end this interview, there might only be one left. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just trying to use this time to, you know, uh, work on the record that I've had and then also just re-examining some of the, the ways I used to do things and, and everything's up for you know, reassessment. And as far as going back into the world, I'm, I'm going to have to wait till the end of May and uh, make another assessment because right now the way the, the medicine looks, it doesn't look like a safe thing to do. So, right. you know, hopefully I'll be proven way wrong with that. But for me, that's what's, that's what's going to be happening. So I'll just be right here blogging away on the website and Shaking that money maker. On money. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, I'll definitely be tuning into the shows. Um, uh, I'll catch what I can live. You know, great thing about Facebook is even if you can't catch it live, you can always catch the replay the next day. And uh, uh, Mike, uh, I wish you much more continued success and look forward to everything coming out from Boo Hatch Studios. And uh, appreciate you being on the show. And uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Big bang. <laughs>